So I'm Scott Hunter, and I'm the Director of uh, Program Management at Microsoft and .NET Platform, and I'm here today just to, to kind of roll, roll through and talk about uh, what we're doing in .NET and how that's going to affect you guys. Um, first off, I want to say thank you guys uh, very much for using .NET. Um, it's been an awesome last year. Um, I've got this really cool slide here uh, that shows that we had 61% year-over-year growth for .NET uh, developers using VS 2012 Plus. Uh, that's really awesome. Um, if people are aware, we shipped a, a new version of .NET uh, in, at the end of June called .NET Core. Um, and one of our goals with .NET Core was to bring new developers to the platform. And 40% of all the developers that, have, that are using .NET Core um, are brand new, to, brand new to .NET. It's .NET for the first time. Um, and then it's also fun for me to show that uh, there was a, an article that went out, I think, a week or so, a week and a half ago, showing that uh, Microsoft had one of the biggest GitHub uh, contributions uh, in GitHub. Um, that was a little false because they took Angular and Google and split them apart. If you actually add those together, Google would be number one. Uh, but I'll be number one or number two. I'm happy about that. But you can see over the years as we open source.net um, how the community has picked up and, and done a lot more for us. Um, and that's really cool for me because uh, when I joined Microsoft in 2007, that was one of our goals was to see if we could actually open source.net. And now that we've actually done it, I'm, I'm super happy. This is a pretty cool slide. Um, one of the things that we do is not only have we open source.net, but we like to measure, um, hey, are we, is there any value in having .NET open sourced? And so we have a, a metric that we look at uh, that looks at the number of comments that people make on our, our repos, the number of pull requests, the number of issues that are opened, and we can track those via GitHub's uh, statistics around the world. And so you, this shows you um, what that traffic looked like in 2015. Um, we're, what, uh, September, we're almost October, um, so we're not even at the end of 2016 yet, and take a look at this. Is that amazing? So this is people that are actually contributing and talking and using our, our open source stuff, which I'm, I'm really excited about. Uh, you know, the next thing is, um, when, I, when I think of .NET, I think of a couple things. I think of, um, over the years, I'm, I'm, how many have been using .NET for more than 10 years? Okay, a lot of folks. Um, we had .NET Framework, we had .NET Compact Framework, we had Silverlight, we had uh, Windows Phone Silverlight, uh, Windows 8, um, Mono, I'm losing some, but there were a lot of .NETs. And um, one of our goals on the .NET team now is to try to reconcile all those .NETs back together into a simple pattern. And this is kind of what I say, a new world for .NET. There's Windows applications, there's cross-platform services, and there's mobile apps. And that really is the breadth of .NET. You can build anything on .NET. Um, and you can see the tier, the, the, the tier frameworks that are associated with this. .NET Framework for building Windows applications, .NET Core for building cross-platform services, um, and Xamarin for building mobile applications. And so, uh, to me, it's like reconciling all these .NETs back together, and I'm gonna talk later on today how we make the API surfaces uh, across all those .NETs match up again as well, which is super important to me. Um, I care a lot about that. And it'll make your life easier as well because you can actually understand the platform. Um, and so, this is, this is kind of the slide that I showed at Build for the first time, or a, a version of this slide at Build, and you'll notice that um, we have .NET Framework, we have .NET Core, and we have Xamarin, and there's this notion beneath all those things of a standard library. Uh, today, people are probably building PCLs, um, which is how you share code across the various flavors of .NET today, and with this .NET standard, the idea is we have one huge, colossal chunk of .NET that is consistent across Windows, cross-platform, and Xamarin. Uh, we're not there today, um, but we're gonna get there within the next three or four months, so I'm, I'm super excited about that. Now, each of these .NETs, um, I, I'll, I'll say one thing is, we have a lot of these .NETs, we have three of these .NETs that are the, the ones that really are the ones driving forward, and for each of these, what I don't want people to freak out about is, um, hey, Scott, I, I didn't see a, a .NET 4.7 this year, is, is that bad? No, that's not bad, because new innovation in .NET will happen in the .NET standard, not in the actual uh, core frameworks themselves. I mean, the .NET framework is mainly focused on Windows applications, so there'll be some, there'll be some new work that'll happen there, but it'll be focused on those, 
those app models, but there'll be a whole bunch of .NET new stuff for everybody, no matter which flavor of .NET you're using. Um, we're in the process right now of, of .NET 4.6. Uh, 4.6.2 is out. Um, and one of my favorite features here, anybody want long path support in .NET? I don't know if you tried it, but it actually works. Um, Windows shell, not so sure. So you can actually make long paths and can't get to them in, in Explorer, uh, but we finally, have, you know, we finally have long path support. Um, we, we continue to try to find ways to innovate in all the, the stacks that are in here. One of my favorite here is WPF. If you're a WPF user and you have two monitors, um, it actually will adjust DPI across the two monitors, which is a, which is a pretty cool thing. Um, ASP.NET 4X, uh, we do most of that out of band, not in the framework. Uh, but there is stuff we're doing there as well. We actually un we, we're starting to unlock and unhook a bunch of hooks deep in the framework that we can do outside of the, outside of the framework itself. Um, and there's a, a, a bunch of better support for um, exceptions in CLR that we've done. Uh, Scott showed this morning the Centennial desktop bridge stuff. That's pretty cool to me. The Centennial work is when you take an existing WinForm or WPF application and we give you the tool chain to be able to actually take that application and publish it to the Windows Store. And I don't know if Scott mentioned this, but corporations your, or your own company can have their own version of the Windows Store. And so this is a great way to have people install applications on their desktops and update the applications using the store model versus whatever model you use today to go push applications out to desktops. Um, another cool thing to me is, um, who in here is thinking about using containers? Anybody? About a third? So containers are a... A, a really hot topic today. And we, we started adding container support to .NET um, a couple months ago when, with .NET Core, because .NET Core ran on Linux and containers were mainly a Linux thing at the time. Uh, we now have containers running on Windows, um, and so I think there's a bunch of Windows Server announcements that's probably happening this week about uh, containers on Windows Server. Um, but the cool thing in this is, you can take any of your existing .NET applications, um, Primarily, this would be, would be web applications like ASP.NET applications, an ASP.NET 4X application, and run these things in containers. Um, the benefits that containers will give you, and I'll, we'll talk about containers a couple times today, the benefits that containers give you for, as, as, an, as an app model is, one thing is, we have a tool chain that lets you run containers on your local machine. So for the first time ever, as a developer, I can control F5 and F5 on my local machine into a, a container that's running the same operating system as my server does. Um, and so it's almost the equivalent of, equivalent of developing live on your server, which I think is pretty dang cool. Um, and the other thing is, it doesn't destroy your machine in the process because everything is self-contained and uh, when I do a container demo when I'm done, I just delete all the containers and my machine is back to exactly how it was before. Um, and that's cool as well. That's the other benefit of the container world is, let's say you're an uh, existing .NET 4X uh, application developer today and your company says, hey, we can't put 4.6.2 um, on this server because it might break other applications. If you run your app in a container, it's completely contained inside that container wall, and you can actually have that app run on an existing server, uh, w and, and you can put 4.6.2 just in the container. Um, and so there's a bunch of benefits you get from containers. The other big benefit that containers will buy anybody is if you build an application that you want to be able to scale up quickly, containers can scale up much faster than how you would scale today. today. Today what you would do is you'd actually go spin up another Windows VM um, and you're gonna copy 10 gigs of stuff across the network to do that. You're gonna wait a few minutes for it to boot up for the first time. You're gonna put your application into it. That's not a quick, that's not a quick scenario. Uh, in the world of containers, once I have one of these things and I've got it deployed to a server, I can just go run a command and make that one container turn into 10 containers. And so it gives you this really fast scale. I know Scott showed some, some, some Linux containers today, and I'm gonna show Windows containers first raw, and then I'm gonna show you uh, what our tooling will look like. Let me drop out of that. Let's jump on my machine here. And so what I've got here is I've just got a regular, this is a ASP.NET Web Forms application and I wrote a little bit of extra code inside of it to actually go and query the underlying operating system, and I'll show that just so I'm, and let's do this. You guys can actually read stuff. Let's go to like, 
Maybe that's too big. Is that readable? This is just a bunch of goop anyways, but this goop, all this goop does is basically spits out the name of the OS and then I copy the name of the OS and, and, and show it in the application here. So if I run the app, you're gonna say AS.NET on Windows, I think is what it's gonna say. Yeah, AS.NET on Microsoft Windows 10 Enterprise. So and what's cool here is all I've gotta do, and I'll show the tooling measure for this in a second, and go away, is I've just got a Docker file. I drag the Docker file into my application and as I said, I'm gonna do this the, the raw way first. So what I need to do is I need to go into the folder of my app. Grab that. Make sure I'm there. Now I'm gonna say Docker, make that bigger too. I'm gonna say Docker, ah. You can tell it to build, and I'm gonna give it a name. And I always leave the dot off the end to tell it to turn a directory. And so what this is gonna do is this is gonna make a container um, for my application. And so you're gonna see a couple things scroll by here, and they're kind of interesting to see. So, First off, it takes a base image. This is an image that I have. It's a, it's a Windows Server image that has ASP.NET installed on it. It says I want to expose the port. It's gonna make a directory in that, in that uh, uh, application. And once it's done make, making the directory, the next step is gonna to be to copy the app that I have into that, into that folder. And this will take a second. And I wanna show this raw because I, when I show it next, I show it with a tooling uh, you kind of understand what's going on under, underneath the covers here. So it's making my folder and thinking. It takes about a minute, minute and a half here to get this to go. Um, but the benefit once I'm done, as I said, is I'm actually gonna be developing on my, on my local machine against Windows Server, um, which I think is pretty cool. And I can do it all very fast. The, you, you spend this time the first time, and once I'm done with this, the next time you can control F5, F5, almost at the same speed that you have when you actually develop an app locally on your box, which is our goal. Our goal is to make being able to develop in containers in Visual Studio as fast and as simple um, as doing it uh, outside of containers. So then you can see I, I imported the IS module. I told the container to create a new ASP.NET uh, application inside of it, gave it a path to my folder that I said before. That's going on right now. The final step will be to actually copy my app in. And while we're waiting for that to happen, I'll just show you that, uh, um, I know Scott showed this this morning, but we have the same thing for Win Windows containers as well. I have the option over here to right click, add, and add Docker support. And those tools are out today. If I run those same tools, you'll get an experience very similar to what Scott showed, where all this actually happens behind the scenes, you don't see it. Um, but I think one of the cool things about containers is I can both do it in, in VS and have VS automate all the flows for me, or I can do it directly from the command line. So I've got a, I've got a container now. There it is, it's called app. And now I can tell Docker to boot that container up and get it running. Let's take a few seconds. Um, and once that happens, I've got this completely isolated environment. I could have actually, in, that, in this Docker file, the Docker file actually tells you what all the operations are. We'll go load that up just for fun. So you can see these commands, the expose the port, where the base image comes from, the PowerShell that I'm running to actually turn stuff on. The cool thing is I could actually go and install other junk into that container and whatever, um, and I haven't hurt my local machine, so I get a, a, a development experience where I can do whatever I want um, and not affect my box. So that container's now running. So we'll find it there, and I'm gonna say Docker, I need to find out what port it's at. Um, I 
that ran ipconfig inside the container. This docker exec command says run this command inside that container. Here's the port. That's there. And it's booting that container up. And so the cool thing is I've got the app running here on my Windows 10 Enterprise. Come on. When this loads up, it'll say that it's running on Windows Server 2016. Bingo. So as I said, that first boot up time, you saw it takes a minute or two. But once I have that, that set up, I, ha I can now F5, Control F5 in Visual Studio, just like I'm, I'm live in that container. What we actually do is we map the file system of the container into your local file system. So Visual Studio is actually working live on the local disk, but that disk is mapped inside the container. And so you, get, you can just change files and stuff just like you would, and you're not touching your box. When you're done, you can nuke it all, and it goes away. Of containers. .NET Core. So this is the, the, the platform we just released this summer. Um, and this is our cross-platform. This is our Windows, Linux, and Mac uh, version of .NET. Um, and my favorite part of .NET Core, um, and this was a goal we had when we started this project, was uh, there's, a, there's a site called Tech Empower, and we'll be, we'll be live on Tech Empower, I hope, in a few weeks. Um, but we are, .NET is eight times faster than Node.js. One of the things that I always hear is, hey, the, you know, the up-and-coming technology, the most popular technology, I hear Node, 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 Node. Um, we're eight times faster than Node, and we're three times faster than Go. Um, and, and that's something that we're not stopping on. I, I, that eight times is going to turn to 10 or 12 times, probably by the end of the year. We're doing a whole bunch of work right now to make .NET go even faster. Um, another big thing is, one of the biggest feedbacks that we got uh, with .NET Framework was, hey, I don't want you to put another framework on my box because it's gonna break the existing applications. And so this thing was designed uh, in two ways. It was designed to have be bin deployable, so it doesn't have to actually touch anything on your machine. You can take a .NET Core application, put it on, on your server, and it will not break any other application. It's totally self-contained. We made the frameworks themselves much more modular, where instead of being the um, everything's on by default that we had in .NET Framework, to if you're writing using ASP.NET Core, everything is light up. You have to light things up one by one by one. And then the other thing is, we think that this container model is going to be super popular. Um, and so one of our goals with .NET Core is to make it designed around containers. And we we're investigating what, what all that means. If you have two containers, how do they, talk, how do they find and talk to each other? Are there services that we build into .NET uh, to make that happen? If you, have a, if you have a container and it scales up into multiple instances, how does your other container know which, which IP to call? Um, so we're looking at, at what we can do to, to build a full support um, in the framework around the, the container space. And then finally, I, I, I assume everybody knows this by now, we open source the runtimes, we open source the libraries, we open source the compilers, uh, the languages, Everything in .NET Core is completely open source. My goal with .NET Core, I never want to go into somebody and tell me that, that uh, they're going to choose Java over .NET because Java is open source. Um, and so that's, don't want that to happen. Thank you. Come on, guys. No, no Java. <laughs> Nobody likes Java. Um, this is, this is uh, the data in our labs just kind of showing you how .NET Core stands up against um, all the competitions. So you can see Node.js down here at 0 .6. Jetty, which is a Java thing, uh, at 1.1. Goes at 1.8. Uh, this is million, millions of requests per second. Servlet's at 2.4. Grizzly, uh, 2.8. We're at 5.2. Um, there is one Java still ahead of us, and it's called Netty. Um, and our goal as a, as a team is to get ourselves past Netty um, in these benchmarks. And the cool thing is, um, a lot of times, you know, if you look at these benchmarks, you could, you could say, Scott, these benchmarks are, are crap. Um, um, I don't, how, many time, how many people in the room send plain text? Nobody does that. Um, we did some synthetic stuff where we actually looked at existing applications. Um, one of the applications that the team built years ago was something, a CMS called Orchard. We ported Orchard to .NET Core, and just by porting it to .NET Core, it was 10 times faster. 
uh, to give you an idea. So if, if you're an MVC customer or a Web API customer uh, or a SignalR customer in the future, all of those frameworks uh, pick up and are much faster on core. The reason they're faster is we reduced allocations. Uh, so there's a huge pile of work that the team has done to reduce the amount of memory that we allocate per request, and that's where the speed comes from. Um, this is pretty cool. This is a, uh, um, there's a company called, or there's a game called Age of Ascents. Um, it's a space, space, space game where you're flying around through universes and stuff like that, um, and it's all built on top of, of .NET Core on the back end. So the back end of that game is, is all done with .NET Core. Um, and you can see here where um, you can see ASP.NET 4.6 down there in the bottom, bottom left, bottom left, and you can see Node.js down there in the bottom left, and you can see this crazy performance graph on, on .NET Core. One of the coolest things about this is the author of the game, Age of Ascent, um, is responsible for about 40% of the performance in .NET Core. Um, so it wasn't even just us that did all the work. He was actually building his own web stack on top of .NET um, when he got a hold of, of us building uh, our new web server called Kestrel that .NET Core is based on. Um, and once he saw that, he actually switched his work to work on Kestrel and make it better. And uh, he, he, to this day, he continues to make uh, awesome perf, perf things. Um, if you want to think about .NET Core, .NET Core is available today. It, it, it shipped at the end of June. Um, the runtime is fully supported. The only thing about .NET Core that's a little weird is our tooling um, is not fully done yet. Um, we made a shift. If anybody's played with ASP.NET Core or .NET Core, um, when we first started those projects, they were built on something called Project JSON, which was its own project system that we built um, as we were experimenting with building a brand new ASP.NET stack. Um, that was great, and we learned a whole bunch from that, but we started trying to make ASP.NET Core and .NET Core interop with existing class libraries, uh, with Xamarin applications and with Unity applications we found that the tension between Project JSON and CS Proj was too much, and so we made a, a shift uh, to move back to CS Proj for ASP.NET Core and .NET Core, and that'll happen. Um, we'll have a, a preview of that later this year, and we'll RTM that early next year. Um, and so that's, that's kind of why the tooling is not 100% in sync. Uh, the good news is we're taking all the features of Project JSON that people liked and putting them back into CS Proj. Um, so that should be good. So we plan to ship a, a new version of .NET Core, the, our 1.1 release, later this year. And there's a whole bunch of updates for ASP.NET Core, .NET Core, and NED Framework Core that come in that. I, I listed just a few of them here. Uh, for ASP.NET, you get URL rewriting, response caching, the ability to pre-compile views. Once again, that's a performance thing that I really care about. Uh, we have a bunch of Azure integration, uh, where if you run the, a, an ASP.NET Core application in Azure, you'll just get a lot of things for free. Examples of things you might get for free is Redis cache support built in. You want to talk to the, the, the uh, logging systems that are in, in uh, uh, Azure. That'll just turn on by themselves with, with this code. Um, and the ability to, uh, there's a technology in Azure called Key Vault where you store your keys and stuff like that and have automatic support for that inside of um, ASP.NET. EF Core gets connection retries. This is a cloud thing as well. If you're on a cloud network and, and, and your connection drops or whatever, have, having the ability for EF to retry and do that. And then a really cool one is um, the newer versions of SQL support in-memory tables, and we added in-memory table support for EF Core. And so what this means is you basically add an attribute to your table in EF Core, and you run a migration on it, and that will tell the SQL server to take that table, run it in memory, and so your performance should go up by a, a, you know, a zillion or something like that. Um, I would hope if your application does not go up by a zillion when your, your table's in memory, you're doing something wrong somewhere. Um, so that's coming uh, later this fall. Um, and then once again, you'll see um, late this fall the first preview of the unified uh, .NET Core tooling. Uh, this is something that's dif different about the .NET Core world. So if you're used to the .NET Framework world today, .NET Framework ships as part of Windows, which means it probably ships on about an annual cadence. Um, and it has support that goes on until the end of time, because um, that's the way Windows works. Um, with .NET Core, we want to move the framework a lot faster than we move the old framework. Um, and so we're going to have two ways of, of running .NET Core. You can run .NET Core on what we call long-term support, um, and this will be a two to three year cycle. And that, if you're running the 1.0.x versions of .NET Core today, 
you'll, you'll, you'll be able to do that. We'll also have what we call current, and this is a faster cycle. Um, we'll have a 1-1, one, one, as I was saying, that will happen in, in, in uh, fall, the late fall. And then after the 1-1, one, one, you'll see a 1-2 every six, in, in six months later, you'll see a 1-2. Six months later, you'll see a 1-3. Um, and as a customer, you can choose to be on either one of these paths. You can be on the long term that goes forever with support for a long term, long time, or you can be on the faster moving track where you're on the one one, the one two, the one threes. And if you want support, you have to be on the latest of those. Um, once again, one of the nice benefits of .NET Core is because it is completely side by side, even if you're on the, the faster, slower track, that's okay. Um, you can put these side by side on the machine and, and you're not gonna break your applications. And so this is a, a new way that we're looking at this. So I'm gonna do a quick demo. I know Scott did ASP.NET Core uh, on Linux, Linux containers, so I'm not gonna spend very much time on it, but I'm gonna make it more radical. Um, so let me just do this. Come over here. First off, there's a really cool feature here that uh, Docker has now. Notice I can do this, I can switch. Um, the Linux containers. So Docker supports both Windows containers and Linux containers on the Windows OS. So I'll switch that, tell it to switch to Linux containers for me. And I will jump out of this folder. And let's do .NET Core. Okay, so this is just a MVC application. And once again, I modified it to, uh, to tell you the host OS that it runs on, which is more challenging than .NET Core. So, there, so it says ASP.NET Core um, on Windows. So that's good. So let's go and close all of you guys out. Let's go and quickly add Docker support for it. And I'll run it in the container real quick just to show that it does and then we'll do something more radical. Add Docker support. Once again, that just does a lot of the, the manual steps that I showed earlier. If I look at my app, what really changed there when I did that was I got a Docker file, uh, which looks different than the one for the Windows containers. It's got a different base image and stuff like that, but I've got that. And let's just try it here real quick just to make sure it runs. And you should see the, the faster tooling that we have here. This will, this will come up and start much faster than the one we did a second ago. There you go. So now it shows ASP.NET Core on Linux, which once again, I think is pretty cool, developing a Linux on my local machine, and that was pretty quick. And to give you an idea of where we want to get with the Windows containers as well, you know, Control F5, we're not happy with the perf here already. Um, so what, 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, four or five seconds to get that up. Um, our goal is to get that to one or two seconds. Um, so that was cool, but let's do something different. So as I was saying before, one of the cool things about .NET Core is the fact that it's cross-platform. And if I look in this file, this file is my project JSON. This is the file that's going away. It's got this, um, thing that tells us what version of .NET Core we're using. And notice it says here, type of platform. And type of platform means that the application doesn't carry a .NET Core with it. Um, what we do is we have a, when you, when you run the .NET Core installer, whether you're on Linux, Windows, or Mac, we copy a folder on your box that contains the, the framework. Um, and so you can basically have a bunch of apps share that same framework. If I go look around, x86 or, yeah, there it was. Yeah, there it is. So there's, here's the shared framework, and if I do this on top of it, um, you can see there's 70 megs worth of stuff there. So there's a shared framework on the box. Now what I'm gonna do is I am gonna remove that line of code, and as soon as I remove that line of code, it, it basically tells the app, 
I, I don't want to run on the shared framework. I want to carry the framework with me. And then what I'm going to do is I, I wrote some, uh, some goop here. And I'm going to stick this at the top of the file. And what this basically does is this is saying, here's the run times that I want the app to build on. In this case, I'm saying I, I want to not be using a shared framework. I want to be completely independent by myself. And so I specify the actual run times that I run on. And so all I've got to do now is save that file. And let's see it's restoring packages. So it's grabbing the packages uh, required for the platform. There you go, that's done. Now what I can do is let's just jump to the folder of this application. Like we were earlier. Okay. And now I'm going to say .NET publish dash runtime. And I'm going to go grab the one of these runtimes. So let's go grab this one right here. And I'm basically saying publish uh, for the OS X. So I'm going to publish for the Mac. And this is a core tenant of .NET Core applications is you can build them on any machine and run them on other machines. So now what we'll do is let's go back here. There's now going to be a bin folder in here. Go in here into OS X. And there's a folder called Publish. Open up another one of these guys. And let's copy Publish over to here. And you're going to see this is going to happen really quick. It's not, it's not really big. It's, it's a self-contained .NET application, pretty small. There we go. So now let's do this. See if the demo gods work with the Mac. I was telling the screen guys, getting a Mac to present is challenging. Go to no name. There you go. Go in the publish folder here. You can see the whole framework in there. ASNet Core. Okay. So I just copied the app, built on my Windows machine, copied to the Mac. Applications now started. Bingo. So that is our vision for .NET Core, is basically build on one machine, copy and run anywhere else that you want. Um, so that's ASP.NET, built on Windows, running on the Linux, I mean running on the Mac. You start running in the containers on Linux, so we run everywhere, which I think is pretty cool. This is actually just running native, just from command line. I'm not running in a container. I could run, I could run containers on Mac as well, but in this case, I actually just copied the raw binary, binary files up to the Mac and ran them on the Mac. So I can basically tell my, my machine what targets I want to publish for. I can publish for Linux, Windows, or Mac, copy them to the Mac, and I'm good to go. I did. Yeah, whole thing. So I could have taken anybody's Mac in the audience that has no .NET, no Microsoft, no nothing on it anywhere, and run it on that. The same thing happens for the Windows app, apps as well, which is one of my things when I talk about side-by-side. -side. I could take the same application, go to a Windows server, and stick it on the, on the machine, and it would just run out of a folder with nothing else 
Um, that's our no registry, no system 32, no nothing uh, kind of world. You don't. So as I showed on the Windows machine, um, I'll jump back over here. On the Windows machine, I was showing earlier, the question was, do I have to have the app, the, the .NET framework in every single application on my machine? You're right, you don't. And I was showing that on any machine, including a Mac or, or whatever, if you install .NET, notice there's a .NET folder in here, and there's a thing called shared. Inside of shared is a shared copy of the framework. And so as an app developer, you have two choices. The app I was first building was using the shared copy of the framework. I changed it to use the non-shared version of the framework. And I'll go back and explain that one more time. So when I first started this, let's go back. This right here, in any .NET Core application, means use the shared framework. So that means I'm gonna go find the shared framework on the machine and use that. When I remove that, what I did is I removed that line, and then I said, here are the runtimes I want you to build for. And then in my bin folder, there's a folder for each of those runtimes when I do a, well, in my case, I told the publish command to publish for one of those runtimes, and it made me one specific for that particular one. If I had .NET, the, the .NET Core SDK on my Mac, I don't even have to do the, the special one. I could have copied the generic one over there and it would have just worked. Um, the other thing while we're here is, before I leave the Mac, go back to the Mac. Um, you know, for people, if, if you have never seen us do this before, I, from the Mac, can do .NET new, which says, make me a new scaffolded app. I can see .NET Restore, which goes and gets the packages required to run the, app, the actual application, and I can say .NET Run to run the application. This is a simple hello world, so it says hello world. Um, but I can also bring up something like Visual Studio Code. This is our, our Visual Studio that runs, or our, our, our editor, I should say, that runs everywhere. Let me open this up. Make that a little bigger. And it's saying, hey, I noticed you can't debug, so do you want the assets to require to debug here? And then what's kind of cool here is, on the Mac, I can go put a breakpoint on, go to the debugger. Go and hit breakpoints on a Mac. So I've got .NET that runs on Linux, Windows, and Mac. I've got VS Code that runs on Windows, Linux, and Mac. And I can debug and build and, and create new applications on all the platforms. And that really is the vision for .NET Core, um, is to let you do whatever the heck you want to do. Okay, let's come out of this. So obviously Xamarin is a big piece and that was one of the things that's exciting to me is the fact that you can now build iOS and Android and Mac apps with .NET as well. Um, and so they're, they're super important. And now I wanna drill in and talk a lot more about this .NET standard library. As I said, when we, when we first started building .NET, the way that we had envisioned of sharing code was something called PCLs. I'm sure people in the room have tried these things. Uh, you create a portable class library and then you right click on it and go to the properties and you can select what frameworks uh, you want that, that that DLL to be able to work on. And the more frameworks you click, the less platforms it can run on. Um, it basically gets smaller and smaller and smaller, so if you click every, every version of .NET, it runs almost nowhere. Um, you can use string and like ints. Um, which is, seriously, it's not, it's not useful. Um, it sounded great at the time, but because of the way .NET kind of grew up, it, it, it made no sense. Uh, it makes no sense today. So in a, in a modern world, what we want to do instead, as I said, we want to have this huge .NET um, surface area that exists across all the .NETs. And so what, we, what we're doing is we're looking at Xamarin, .NET Framework, and .NET Core, and saying all the code that's not app model specific, and an app model to me is a WPF, a WinForms, a WCF, an ASP.NET, Entity Framework, those are all app models that are built on top of .NET. And 
Um, if, 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 if your code's not part of one of those things, let's put it in .NET Standard. Um, and so as a developer, it means all you've got to do is, if you know .NET Standard, you are, you are in good shape because you can re that code runs on Xamarin, Core, and, and, and Windows Desktop. And so um, it should be good. We've already shipped the .NET Standard with .NET Core. It's a, very, it's, it's a very limited one. .NET Core, when we first started, started in a, in a very different place. When we first started working on ASP.NET ASP 5 and .NET Core, the idea was we were gonna envision a brand new world with a brand new .NET that was, we took all the things out of .NET that we didn't think should be there, um, which of course was just our opinion, which is bad. Uh, as we remove stuff, we just took stuff out like, ah, nobody should have that, so we took it out. Um, that didn't make a lot of sense, um, and so we kind of got, changed our model now where it's like, hey, we wanna support .NET everywhere, and so let's go put the right stuff in .NET so it runs on all the platforms. And so, um, as I said, .NET, .NET standard as it ships today is very limited, um, but as we move forward into the new world, .NET standard 2 is coming early next year. Um, everything between .NET framework, Xamarin, and Core, um, and .NET Core is gonna gain all those APIs as well. So .NET Core is gonna gain 50,000 plus APIs as part of this. Um, and the cool thing is, uh, .NET Standard actually works even against legacy DL DLLs. You can take a DLL that you wrote 20 years ago, and it, it will run on, on uh, a, a .NET Standard-based .NET platform uh, via some cool technology that we have. Um, so let's show what's coming back. If you're a .NET Core customer, if you tried .NET Core, all this stuff is coming. XML, schemas, formatters, data contracts, XML sockets, web sockets, files compression, uh, threads, thread pools, tasks, all this stuff is coming back. And so um, my hope is that we have this massive .NET, .NET standard that everybody is used to um, and can compile against and, and run their apps on. That's the hope. Um, and then I get this diagram that kind of shows that no matter what you have, whether it's a core app, a full framework app, a Xamarin app, they all talk to .NET standard, um, and then that .NET standard then talks to what, what, whatever underlying tech you have. It could be an existing .NET standard library, it could be an existing portable class, or existing .NET, so it, it runs everywhere. So the next thing I wanna focus on is some of the cool stuff we're doing in the VS world um, as we move forward. So Scott already showed you guys this morning the new lightweight installer. So the idea with the, the installer for, for uh, Visual Studio 15 is you just check the stuff you want and you don't get you know, 20 gigs of stuff. Um, and another big push that we're doing is a ton of work has been done to reduce memory uh, inside of Visual Studio. So um, we looked at a ton of customer projects that have tons, you know, solutions with hundreds of projects inside of those things, uh, trying to work on making us use less memory. So there's been a huge memory squeeze, which means you're your app will be, your Visual Studio will be faster, your fans will spend less, should be great. Um, another big thing that we really care about, and I'm gonna do some pretty cool demos on this, is how do we make productivity better? Um, how do we make the editors do the things that you think they should do versus uh, fighting those things? And so I'm gonna show a couple demos of cool stuff here. Um, and then finally, um, you know, I kinda mentioned this earlier, we wanna have the best tools for building uh, containers and, mic and, and microservices um, that is super, super important to us, um, and you're gonna see us evolve that a, a whole bunch. Okay, so let's do a couple of things. Let me close these down. So I got some really cool demos. Um, two of them are gonna be really, they're mind-blowing, I think, um, and we'll end um, with some stuff where I show some of the new stuff coming in C-sharp 7. Okay. So this is, this is a, uh, this is Visual Studio 15, this is Preview 4, the same one you guys have. And one thing I did that's kind of cool here is, this is a change in, in, in uh, VS 15 is now even third parties can actually be on the, on the front page here. So you notice that GitHub is actually, because I've installed a GitHub extension, it's actually a first class citizen. So I can open right from GitHub inside of here. And I'll search for Ignite. And I'll find the Ignite demo, and I can easily clone it into my application. 
comes down. All right from the home page of Visual Studio. And what I'll do now is I'm going to go and make sure that I'm on the Dev 15 branch. And I will find the app. I want to do the productivity app here. We'll open this up. And then I'll show one of my, 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 cool, my, one of my favorite new features in WPF. Go away. OK, so let's run this application. Take a second to grab some nougats. Let's run it. Uh, it would help if I actually did not run the class library. Let's run the desktop app here. This is some stuff that actually started, started shipping as part of um, some of the updates we had earlier this year. When I'm in debug mode, I can actually, very similar to the web, I get a selector, I can move around, and so we'll select, select Dimitri, he's in the marketing group, and I can press this button over here, and this is go to live visual tree. And so you'll see what happened in my Visual Studio is it jumped to the actual code in that WPF that makes up that particular element. I can double click on it, And now, I'm in the actual XAML for that particular element. Now, what's cool is this has got live editing in it. So as I type inside of my XAML, I'll type font size equals one. We'll jump back. Notice all the names went away. Font size equals 20. All the names are back. And so I don't have to start and stop my WPF application as it's running. I can basically turn that on. I can basically live edit my XAML without restarting the application, which should actually save people a ton of time as you're developing. Just live edit your XAML code in the background while your app's running, and the screen just refreshes instead of the stop, start, stop, start, stop, start. This is available today and even in Dev 14, uh, which is the current version of Visual Studio, um, if you uh, have it on your machine. Okay, so we'll stop that. Okay, so let's switch to this guy. Let's show some more productivity stuff. Nine seconds. Let's jump all over the place. Let's do something different. So um, for starters, let me show you one of my favorite demos. You are. I'm not switched yet. I think this is actually too big. So this is a, a existing application. Um, it basically looks at a, an array of integers. I had some junk. Um, and basically we'll tally them up, take the numbers and add them all together, and uh, show you the result. And it's very similar to what you would write today. Um, it is what you would write today. Notice that I've got, I call this function. I've got this struct with uh, the return types. Um, and that's pretty simple. So one of the cool C-sharp 7 features we have is something called tuples. Um, all of us have plenty of this, this kind of junk right here. Throwaway classes. So let's just make that go away. I don't want that anymore. And then, let's here, 
let's say I want to have an int sum and an int count. And so basically my C sharp can now return multiple results. I don't have to have just a single result, either a class um, or not. And then we'll just say return, that's our sum, that's our count. Should have built. And it runs, produces the same result. And so this is a feature we call tuples. And with tuples, you no longer have to create all these junk classes uh, to return results. C sharp functions can now return as many, many parameters as you want as part of your result. And so just write them in parentheses, give them types. Um, and you'll even notice here that if I hover over here, you'll see that it actually tells me, hey, I know that return type is a, is a tuple with an int and a count. And so you get the same IntelliSense and stuff that you were used to today um, automatically. Um, this is something that we did even, even, be even before adding tuples, um, and I hope people are using this today. Is this, I'm using the old style zero one stuff here. If you put the dollar sign here, instead I can do r dot sum, and I can do, these are C sharp things that I don't think people are, a lot of folks are aware that you can do today. r dot count, and I never have to wonder what parameter for what number you have there, um, it just works. Yep, that's good. Um, I can make one final change here. I could do something like object and turn this to an object. And then because I've done that, I'm, I'm stuck in a world now where I don't know if a V is a, 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 an integer or not. So I'd have to do some kind of type check. You know, I do this, and then I would write some code where I would actually then create another variable. Why not just let me actually declare it here, like that. So I can now declare my variable as part of that. And my code just works. So we're doing lots of small incremental stuff in C Sharp. Uh, to make it a better language. Um, the cool thing is moving forward, you're going to see Sharp accelerate at a much faster pace. So um, I'm showing C Sharp 7. Uh, the plan is moving forward is to be able to ship C, C Sharp about every maybe quarter or half year, um, basically as a NuGet package. So you're going to see much faster integration with C Sharp. Everything I'm showing here today um, is also available in Visual Basic. So with the next preview of, of uh, Visual Studio that, uh, 15 that's coming out, all of this stuff has been moved to Visual Basic as well, so if you're a Visual Basic customer, you get the same thing. So that's tuples. Is that cool, guys? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want to use tuples, you need to be using the preview edition. So um, the code it generates, though, should run on, if you build a DLL, um, minus the fact you couldn't call it from anything else, uh, should run everywhere. In the, next, in the next month or two, I think you'll actually have us declare um, probably the full schedule for you for that. So there's one more preview coming, and then I think you'll see us declare what the schedule will be. It's not, it's not super far out, I can tell you that. The, AS, the question was when is the next version of Visual Studio going to be ready? So it's, it's coming, coming pretty soon. So let's do, let me do that demo. Um, the, the main thing about tuples is basically, you know, anonymous types. Hit me afterwards, actually, and I'll, I'll, I'll just sit on, sit on the computer and I'll actually show you the difference. 
I want to at least get through the, the next two or three demos that I've got here. So let's do, let's try this crazy demo. This is, this is a, uh, a really cool one for me. This is something that uh, has a bunch of stuff that, that uh, should already be in. You know, one of the things that's fun for me is as being part of the team as, I, as we build some of this stuff. You kind of ask yourself the question, why have we done this yet? Um, why are things the way they are? And this is a, uh, one that's a great example of, of that. So what I'm going to do is I am going to show a cool thing that's kind of, I think, the future direction of where we want things to go. So I've got a console app here, very boring. I'll, I'll change this a little bit. Um, and so I, I commonly might want to do something, and we all do this. Uh, I want to go find some code on the internet to do something. So we want to build that feature into VS. So I press control, control shift F1, and now I can basically ask it a question like, um, how do I convert XML to JSON? And so that went out and found something on JSON.net site. Hey, that's totally fine. Now, I can click the button here. Now, what's different here is this is actually using Bing under the, under the covers, and, and the idea is for us to have a graph of, of being able to make sure that Bing returns the right results for these types of things. But I can press the copy button here. And the nice thing here is um, if, I, if I do that, I will, actually I want to do, <laughs> so funny, so funny, so funny. <laughs> uh, what do I want, I, I like this one. So, I, I, you find some code, and the idea is for us to be, able to, to be able to go look at the code and make sure that when you want to copy something from the code that we find on the internet, that it's actually, you know, code. And so the nice thing here is, is you went to JSON.net site, where this came from, um, you would find a bunch of text and stuff around this, and so the, the cool thing here is we've actually stripped out all the other stuff and only shown the code. And then, of course, I can, uh, you know, do some of this kind of stuff. Yeah, I need using system XML. And then I'm going to show the, the resharper feature that we've never had in Visual Studio that we, we should have. And this is the magic um, uh, go, go grab the package for me. So I just click there, and it went and added the package for me. And so now my app, app, app runs. Um, now, what's cool about that is, is we actually, that, that feature, we did it a little better than, than uh, the resharper guys. At least I think we did. Um, we, we, we are looking at putting all the things that NuGet does into uh, deeper into VS. And so if you look here, here's my reference uh, to, to, to Newtonsoft over here. Now watch this. I'm going to come up here and say edit global undo find and install latest version. And notice that it took it out. So you can basically use our feature to go and add a new package in. We put it in the undo redo buffer. And so if you decide, hey, that's not the package I want, you just click undo in the, in the editor, and we rip the package back out and all the dependencies that the package had. Um, and you'll notice if I do a redo, it comes back. So the idea is putting, putting things like NuGet directly into the undo redo buffers. Now I'm going to go off a little off script here. This, this demo is... Uh, a little dated on this particular computer. I'm going to make a small change here. Um, I'm going to switch from using uh, 901 to 803. And I'm going to do that because it's going to let me show you where we're taking this technology. OK. So this was great. I found my source code on the internet uh, via the search. I, it, it pasted it in. I uh, control dotted to fix by XML. Uh, using control dotted to add my NuGet package. But you know, I might want to see the source code for serialized XML node. Let me press F12. Hmm. 
So what, that, what happened, you just saw the source code for JSON.NET show up in Visual Studio. Um, the reason that happened is we're looking at having a, a mechanism where we basically index the top 100 NuGet packages on the internet, including the package and the source code that, that goes with it if it's an open source package, and having that in a database somewhere uh, that's accessible. That means that you'll be able to F12 into any of our source code or F12 into any third party source code that's indexed in our system. Now what's cooler, that, that, that's great. Okay, so you got the source code. But what happens if I put a breakpoint in the source code? Run the app. Bingo. Breakpoint in JSON.NET. This is where we're headed. This is the kind of stuff that we're looking at doing as we move forward is, is uh, use NuGet packages, F12 directly in the source code. One of the reasons that I care about this and why this scenario is important to me is I want to make Visual Studio use, use less memory. I'm sure everybody in this room has solutions with tons of projects just so you can refactor, you can source, search, search code and all that stuff. That's the only reason you have 30 projects in your solution is so you get those capabilities. What if you had the capability to index the source code in your own repos using this technology, and you didn't have to have all those projects in there because your system knew how to find that code anyways. That's the, that's the vision. Um, this won't ship as part of Visual Studio 15, but I hope that in like the update one, update two time frame, uh, we can ship a little bit of this stuff. Do what? That's, the, that's, that's exactly what I was, I was saying before. Not only do I want to have it work with the global NuGet, but I'd love to be able to have it support your local code as well. So if you have your own NuGet server on, on premise, um, you know, I can't say that'll happen day one, but that's, that's the vision. The vision is all your code, wherever your code is, we find a way to index it. You'd have to tell us where to, where, you know, where to do that in some cases. Um, but that's a, that's a big push we're trying to make. Um, let's do one more of these. Has anybody in the room ever used FXCOP? Couple people? So FXCOP is a tool um, that we use internally uh, as we were building the .NET framework. It contains a bunch of rules um, on how applications should, or functions and such should be written. It's best practices is the best way to say it. And it was a static analyzer tool. So it was a tool you basically would go run against your source code at some point, it spit out a huge report with piles of pos false positives and stuff like that. It was, it was Good and bad, inside of Microsoft, it was a requirement for us as we built our stuff. Um, now what's cool is, is uh, what we're looking at doing is turning that into something a little different. I'm not sure I have my machine set up for it or I'm in the right version of OBS here. I think I, I did, good. I have it set up correctly. Um, and so, as we move to something called Roslyn, that's our compiler that we use today, we want to look at being able to take the features of FXCOP and make them just live in Visual Studio all the time, but take them even better. Not just have a report that tells you what's wrong with your code, but what if you could just press a button and we would fix your code for you? And, and that's kind of the goal. And analyzers, as I said, is a, is a feature of the Roslyn compiler. That's, that's the compiler we use for C Sharp and, and Visual Basic today. Um, and it actually already exists. I'm in Dev 14. And notice under my references, I have this analyzers node. And so how do I add an analyzer? Well, an analyzer is just a NuGet package. So if I go to manage NuGet packages, um, in my case, I'm gonna select this thing down to fxcop, and I'll go to browse, and we'll say include pre-release, because these are all pre-release. And you're gonna see that I get a bunch of these uh, analyzers here. And so I'm gonna add, let's, let's do system runtime analyzers Add this thing, and by the way, these are, these all exist today. There's a NuGet, uh, there's a GitHub account that has all these things in it. Um, and let's do one more. Let's add Microsoft API Design Guidelines Analyzers. So I've got these things here, and I'm good to go. So let's go back to the program. Now, now after I did that, what's interesting if I go and look over in that analyzer node. Suddenly, you see a whole bunch, whole bunch more stuff here. 
these are these analyzers that I just added into the system here. And I'm bummed. Let me do one thing here. I should use def 15. Do the same thing real quick. Go add desktop, browse. API design guidelines. And let's go add system runtime analyzer. Too many Visual Studios. So there's the analyzer node. And now, if I drill into it, you see all these rules that show up. And these are all the rules that used to exist in FXCOP. And for each of these rules, I can decide, do, does it have a default behavior? Does it cause an error, a warning, an info? Do I just don't care about it, so I hide it? So imagine being able to have all these rules, these analyzers that look at your code and find problems in your code, and being able to control those as, as, as part of your team and run those things. Um, so I've added these things. Now let's throw a little code over here and see what we can do. So I've got a couple of examples here that I can throw in. So let me throw one out here. Here's an exception. We'll drop an exception in here. And you see that there's, a, there's an error here, or, or a, a squiggle. And it basically says, there's a couple things here. Add, add the following constructor means that for exceptions, they're supposed to have uh, uh, multiple, uh, Constructors, one that, one that takes an exception and one that takes a string. And so I can basically tell it to go implement. It'll show me the fix. And it can actually implement the fix for me as well. In a perfect world, the squiggle will go away. There we go. And so imagine for all these types of cases, here's, an, here's another example of this. Here's a, a async. And it just happens to be that, uh, got a couple of problems here. Not hang that out in the middle of nowhere. Um, a couple of problems here is um, there's a squiggle here. I see the problem. This is even cooler. I can click that, and it will actually take me to the thing that tells me what that, what that problem is, and so I could actually read more about it. Or once again, I can just say fix. First off, I need to use system.net. And then the second one, this is the one we really care about. I pin that to the end of my, my string. I'm good. I've got one final one. An array one here. I must not, must not brought the right analyzer in for that. But the idea is there's a bunch of these rules out there. You can even build your own for your own teams. And these things run in the background. They squiggle. And you can see fixes. So let's jump back to this laptop. Scroll down to here. So we showed the productivity stuff. We showed what's new in C-sharp. A um, whole bunch of folks from my team are out here this week. I've got Dan Roth. He's, he's the PM on the ASP.NET Core MVC uh, framework. He's talking tomorrow. We have Casey. She is going to, if, if you see Casey's session, she, has she will show you stuff that Visual Studio does you have no idea. Um, every time I see her, I make her record what she shows me because it's amazing. Uh, Rich Lander. Rich is the PM on the .NET Core 
uh, team. And so he's gonna talk about how to use and build .NET Core. Um, Mads Christensen, he's a phenomenal guy on my team that works on the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript editors and, and some of our tooling for, for ASP.NET. And he's gonna come out and show some really cool web stuff. Uh, Rowan Miller, if you're an EF customer, whether you're EF Core or EF, Rowan is the EF guy, and he's gonna come speak about uh, EF on Thursday. And then I just touched the surface on containers. Steve and Glenn. Steve is the tooling guy in, in Visual Studio that works on containers. Glenn is the framework guy in ESP.NET on containers. And then finally on Friday, um, Dan's gonna go deep dive on, on ASP.NET Core and, and probably show you crazy stuff. Um, thank you guys very much for showing up today. 